I did not expect to be changed by becoming married because I couldn't, I couldn't tell that anything would be different. But being in the room in front of my whole community and Eric's whole community and being so deeply seen in our connection and affirmed in our connection is incredible. And, and it did something to relax our relationship, I think. And it, it's different for me coming out of it in a way that I don't think it would have been if we hadn't had a Quaker ceremony. So what's your first Quaker wedding? What I would recommend doing, one, silence your cell phone, because there's going to be a lot of quiet. There's going to be a lot of quiet. If you're invited to a Quaker wedding, it's because the couple getting married really values you and that they want you with them as they make these vows. So I think what to expect at a, a, at a Quaker wedding is maybe, you know, the opposite of what many weddings can be very lavish, you know, um, that there is a real heart of simplicity. And there's such elegance and beauty in that simplicity. So to come prepared for the kind of simplicity that is both, you know, elegant and beautiful, and to find the beauty in that simplicity. Well, the most unique thing about a Quaker wedding is that there is no officiant at the front of the room marrying the couple. The couple are marrying themselves. And there's a couple ways that you can think of that. Um, you can think of it as God has already married the couple in their hearts, and they are pub publicly attesting to that, and their community is witnessing and affirming that that's true. The other way you can understand it as um, the couple are in that moment marrying each other, um, again, before a community. Quakers believe that no one can marry a couple except the two of them and God. That it would be sort of untrue to have an officiant say, I'm pronouncing you, you're married. You know, the only person who can say that you're married is you and your partner and God um, and the space that you leave for God in your relationship. So rather than a pastor or minister being the person who marries uh, the couple, or um, it is the people getting married themselves who are doing so. And um, they're doing so before God and their gathered community and making a promise to the community that they will work hard and abide by their vows in the community in return is making a promise to the couple that they will support the couple. You may wonder what you should wear to a Quaker wedding. My grandfather asked me this question about two months before our wedding. And I told him, Grandpa, there's going to be everything there from people in nice jeans to three-piece suits. There won't be any cutoffs and there won't be any tuxedos. And that pretty much describes every wedding I've been to. Some weddings will definitely be formal. When I got married, I wore a long white gown. Uh, my husband wore a suit. Um, our family and friends dressed up a little bit. I think it would maybe be unusual to go to a black tie Quaker wedding. You probably won't see a row of groomsmen all in tuxedos. Um, so my advice to you about what to wear to a Quaker wedding is to read the invitation and do what it says. <laughs> So it's um, so first sort of like put on a clean sheet of paper because <laughs> it's not like you might have expected a traditional wedding in our culture to be. Mm -hmm. um, it starts basically built around a worship service, a Quaker worship service. And so as community, we gather. The traditional 
Quaker wedding will proceed like a meeting for worship. They will have done their premarital counseling with committees. Clearness committees will have done all of that ahead of time. Typically, the couple will walk in together, will sit in the front of the worship room. Sometimes the family will walk the bride and groom in. Sometimes the bride and groom walk in together. So there's a lot less of that sort of, I think, couple focus focusedness. Um, the family or the father doesn't give the bride away. There's none of that sort of like tr transactional um, trappings that sometimes are in other weddings. But essentially the couple comes in together. There'll usually be an announcement of what's about to happen. So a description of the traditional Quaker wedding will be given. There might be music or they might not. And then you will settle into silence as you would in a meeting for worship in an unprogrammed setting. It's pretty common early on in the wedding that there will be five, sometimes ten minutes that will be completely silent before the couple exchange vows. If you're religious or you're spiritual of whatever faith tradition you're a part of, it's a time where we enter into this holy space. Because for us, for Quakers, it is not the meeting house that is holy. There is, there is no consecration of this, these grounds. This is not a holy space. But it's holy while we're together. So you're entering, in a Quaker wedding, you're entering into a sacred and holy space. And you're part of what makes it sacred and holy by your presence. Before everything really gets started, you'll walk into a service and sit down. And there will be this period of time when everything is silent and you have no idea what you're supposed to be doing. If you know if you're not used to silent worship, that's like, what's going on? <laughs> when is something going to happen? My niece was two at our wedding. As soon as the silence started, she started saying, no one's talking. No one's talking. No one's talking. Which I think is probably how a lot of non-Quakers who were there also felt. <laughs> um, but she was the only one who said it out loud because she was two. So something that you might think about is, um, is thinking about if you're praying sort of a person or even just a reflective person, think about the couple. Um, this is a time to really think about um, what you, the joy and the love that you have for them. For me, a Quaker wedding is an opportunity to let go of any agenda besides delight in the person that you're rooting for. I don't know if you've ever been uh, to an athletic contest where you so strongly wanted one of one team to win, that you were really on somebody's side and you were just sitting there, maybe you were yelling out as loud as you could, rooting for them to win. And that's what we do in Quaker meeting, but we just happen to keep quiet while we're doing it. But inside, we have this chance to just 100% root for the success and the happiness, the delight and love of the person that's getting married or the pair of them together. And after a few minutes, the nervous couple will rise and facing each other, take each other by the hand and repeat the traditional Quaker wedding vows, which in my wife's and my case back in 1974, were in the presence of God, I take thee, Jane, to be my wife, promising with divine assistance to be unto thee a loving and faithful husband as long as we both shall live. What I love about that vow is how simple it is. All you are promising to do is be loving and faithful. And of course, those are enormous things. I know a lot of, a lot of wedding vows, people write their own vows, they go on, there's a lot of inside jokes or you know, long promises. And I think that that is really beautiful and it comes from the people who are marrying. But what we wanted was this really simple promise, um, which was brief, but also had space in it, space within loving and faithful for us to decide what that meant and what that looked like and to keep deciding it for the rest of our lives together. So those are the vows and they're very simple and they're stood with the couple standing in front of the meeting um, I stood right over there with my partner, and, um, and then afterwards, um, we sign the marriage certificate. This goes back 
hundreds of years to when Quakers as a nonconformist group had no ordained clergy. The only thing that legalized their marriages was this certificate that had their essentially their genealogy on it, who they were, who their parents were, and what their vows were. And then that stick will be read as the couple goes back and <sighs> sits down finally, <sighs> having done their vows and gotten through the nervous part of it. Then we go back into silent worship. And at that point, um, people present can stand and speak. Whereas uh, a pastor or a priest might talk about what marriage is and these two people in particular that are being married in that moment, uh, that's something we will do as a group. And uh, each participant is, is uh, welcomed to uh, speak something if they feel uh, a clear sense of leading or prompting by the Spirit to rise uh, out of the silence and uh, speak a few words of encouragement, maybe out of your own experience of, of marriage or uh, your knowledge of one or both of the, of the two people getting married. And that can be really rich. You don't have to share, um, but you might feel called to share something. Um, give some space in between messages. It just allows the messages to really resonate with folks, to really land on folks. It's kind of like having a conversation with someone who is really listening to you really well. That one of the signs that someone is listening to you is when you stop talking, they don't respond right away. You have the sense that they're really taking in what you had to say before they start thinking about, did they have a response? It's that kind of silence that it follows a message. I find myself standing up and speaking in the middle of one of these Quaker weddings at, uh, if I, only if I can't hold back any longer. I, when, the, when my heart just feels so full that I need to express it. I try to express it briefly because I know others will want to as well. For some people, the closest they have ever seen is the toasts and roasts at a bachelor party or a rehearsal dinner, and it ain't that. I think also, more practically, toasts are often funny um, or sort of roasty, um, and messages come from a place of sincerity. There's a qualitative difference, I think, that the message is more, a little more reverent. Um, a little more rooted in, in seriousness and the gravity of the occasion. There's, there's room for laughter and, and lightness, but uh, still you want to sort of keep some sense of the gravity of, of this moment in these people's lives. And, and uh, so hopefully you, you strike a balance with that. There's a particular spiritual rhythm to weddings because generally there are more messages in weddings because people are filled with the love and excitement. But if it's always kind of touching that, um, that point of silence and then coming again, that way spirit is continuously invited to be present in the room. And see, we say with divine assistance in most of the vows, so the wedding is the opportunity to practice letting divine assistance start seeping into this couple's shared community experience. So after a period of time, there'll be lots of messages that have happened, and then there might be this silence that settles over the wedding. Um, and the way that you know that it's done is that people will start shaking hands. Usually someone up at the front will start shaking hands, probably with the couple and then people around them. That's a time to greet each other and to, um, and to, to greet the person, the people next to you, whether you know them or not. I mean, I think it's like every other wedding where someone gets up and says, you're married. <laughs> and like we kissed several times and sort of ran out of the room. I mean, that was pretty... <laughs> That's a pretty good indication that the wedding is over. The ceremony. <laughs> the ceremony part. That's a good indication that the ceremony part of the wedding is over. 
And then comes the party. Yeah. Quakers love to party in varieties of ways. Um, some people have blowout huge parties and tents afterwards, and some just have a small reception at the meeting house. The Quaker wedding format is a bit strange for some portion of the people there, right, who aren't Quakers. And so it may feel to some folks a bit confining. So that makes it all the more fun then to party afterward because that's a chance for us to do however we do in a, in a celebration kind of way. And then people hang out. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's have fun dancing. You know, depending on the kind of Quaker wedding, you know, folks getting married, it's... It is not abnormal for Quakers to get down, so be open to that being a possibility. But something before you get there, something that as part of that transition point, what you'll do is you'll be part of signing the marriage certificate. Everyone who's attended signs the certificate. So the certificate, in, in addition to having the, basically the vows uh, of the couple on it. It also has all the names of all the people who were there. And that is formalized at the end of the wedding by all of us signing the, the wedding certificate uh, with our names that we were witnesses to, to them uh, making promises to one another and, uh, and joining our intentions with theirs uh, that this will be a successful marriage. And we are also committing ourselves, really, uh, in whatever ways turn out to be possible for us to support them and to uh, encourage them in, in that commitment that they're making that day. It's no longer, in most cases, the legal document. They've already gone downtown and gotten their certificate and their license. But this will be framed and will be hung on their bedroom wall or their living room wall and for the duration of their lives will represent who that community of witnesses was. And it's a moving thing to see, to reflect on. It reminds you of the vows you took, the promises you made. And there's that little nephew who signed in big block letters at age three, who is now married with children of his own in his 40s. And they're the beloved parents and grandparents who've passed on to their great reward, but there are those in these neat columns of witnesses that were there. So in that sharing, that worship, uh, with maybe vocal ministry, prayer, a few songs, always going back into the silence, the hearts of the community are knit together. The couple's hearts are knit together in love for each other and appreciation for the community that is holding their marriage. And then this particular group of people who have assembled for this particular event become um, an entity, a spiritual entity that will actually never ever get together again, but who all commit at some level to care for uh, this couple that's going to go through uh, marriage and hopefully a life together. And I think as we all know, there's the love and joy and blush of the beginning of uh, relationship and marriage and all that kind of stuff. And then there's the long journey into deepening that relationship that has uh, rough edges, big mistakes, um, poor responses to big mistakes, um, and yet some effort to build a life together and to grow and change. All of that is being held uh, by the gathered community. So instead of being a sort of list or, or schedule of sayings and prayers and things that have been written by other people, the content of a Quaker wedding is a specific group of people with their specific love for, uh, and well-wishing for, for a specific couple. Yeah, it's a very special thing. 
Hi, my name is John Watts. I'm the director of the Quaker Speak Project, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who participated in this week's video and to everybody who submitted their wedding photos for us to use. This was an epic video for us, and we couldn't have done it without your help. Also, thank you for watching this video. We release a new video every Thursday. You can click on the button over here to subscribe to the channel. You can support us for as little as $1 per video. That button is just below me. And you can see more videos about Quaker weddings in this playlist down here. Thanks again for watching and have a great Thursday.